Good evening. Uh, the Evanston City Council meeting of May 9th, 2002 will come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Wynn? Here. Councilmember Newsma? Here. Councilmember Burns? Here. Councilmember Sufferden? Here. Councilmember Ravel? Here. Councilmember Reed? Here. Councilmember Hedakaris? Here. Councilmember Kelly? And Councilmember Braithwaite? Here. Uh, with eight members having answered the uh, roll call, we have a quorum present and are ready to do our work. Uh, we will begin with uh, my public announcements and proclamations. Uh, last week was uh, Public Service uh, Appreciation Week, and uh, we actually had a really wonderful and frankly long delayed by the pandemic celebration in the Civic Center, thanking our uh, team members who have been here for five and 10 and 15 and so forth years. Uh, we didn't have a council meeting last week though, so we didn't have an opportunity to thank the council members who have been uh, uh, serving for those increments of time, uh, which is also an important thing for us to do. So I wanna ask Bob Gustafson to come forward and uh, um, let us know who's here to be presented their, um, their recognitions. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Bob Gustafson. I'm in Human Resources, the Safety and Workers Compensation Manager. And I'm here tonight to help recognize uh, the elected officials who have, uh, there are three of you who have five years of service and one of you who has 25 years of service. Uh, Mr. Mayor, would you like to come forward? The first council member we have is council member Eleanor Ravel. Five years of service. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, give him the folder back. <laughs> The next council member we have is um, council member Devon Reed, five years of service. The next council member we have is council member Thomas Sufferden, five years of service. And our fourth and final council member with 25 years of service, council member Melissa Wynn. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your service. Thank you so much, Bob. And thanks to all of you for the remarkable amount of time you give the city on a daily basis and also over the course of the years. As a, um, as a um, elected official, serving I believe the last day of my first year in office. Um, I am always very, very, very appreciative of uh, the experience of those around me who are so generous with their time and helpful in educating me. So thank you so much to all of you. Uh, that concludes uh, my announcements and the next item on our agenda is the city manager's public announcements. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Clerk Mendoza, members of City Council, Kelly Ganderski, Interim City Manager. Um, I'm proud to announce that our public um, works department has been overachieving and won two awards tonight. Um, one is the American Public Works Association's Excellence in Snow and Ice Awards. Um, and Edgar Kano is the Acting uh, Public Works Director and also the Bureau Chief um, for that division. So I want to congratulate Edgar and his team. Worked very hard to earn that award. And the second award is um, goes to Daryl King, who is the Bureau Chief for the Water 
Bureau, um, the AWWA Ambassador Program, the City of Evanston won the gold standard for water. So I want to congratulate Daryl and his team as well. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, and thanks everyone for your wonderful work. Uh, next on our agenda is communications from the city clerk. Um, we received just two email um, public comments that is either in your inbox from Gail Sch Schnechter and Schechter. Schechter and Rick Marsh um, stating um, who they support for city manager. That's it. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to public comment. Uh, this evening, everyone will be given three minutes uh, for their public comment. Uh, we begin by those who uh, those who uh, signed up in person to give comment in person, starting with Clark McCarthy. Oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. Uh, in that case, next will be Mark McEwen. Good evening. Um, I'm Mark McHugh and I live at 1421 Davis Street. I'm in the second ward. Peter, good to see you again. Uh, the good news is I haven't spoken with this council in over two years. And so I'm here tonight um, because it's not on your agenda, uh, but it's in the news and it's creating a significant amount of conversation among friends and neighbors uh, where I live and that's the Margarita Inn and the connections for homeless. And I have a specific concern for you tonight, which is about the process. So it's not about the decision, but it's about the process and it's about your role in the process as I see it now. Um, my background on this is my last corporate role. I worked with the executive committee of that, so executives like yourselves. And what they asked me to do was anytime we worked with outside vendors or we worked with big customers, and there was a request for exception for a process that the executive committee yourselves had already approved. It was my job to look at that and then determine when did we need to get you in the loop on it, even before it came to signature or it came in at the last minute, and then to help you analyze was it in the best interest of the business. We had corporation counsel, general counsel that would look at the legality of it. We called it what's the ripple effect. So if we made this decision and we approved it for this customer, how many other customers would want to have the same terms? And then was it in our best interest to offer that? And then could we afford to do it, right? Or were we going to damage? Same thing if we worked with the vendor, how many other vendors, once these terms became public, would also want these terms? And what's the ripple effect on the other side of the lake? In my opinion right now, the current process that's going on with the Margarita Inn, the Connections for Homeless, needs to be on your forefront right now because I see a ripple effect going on and I'm not aware of all the briefs that you get, nor should I be. You've got a terrific interim city manager. Kelly's done really terrific work with us. But it's my concern that you're, you may not have the information in front of you, and yet this discussion is going on in the community. I normally don't like to talk about process, but process is basically what you put in place to mitigate risk to the city for both this current council as well as future councils, because that's ultimately you're trying to avoid litigation. And, you know, whether it's from external or internal, you're trying to avoid litigation, which is normally our largest risk. But you're also trying to identify upside, so if something goes really well, we don't have to come back to you and ask for approval. We can just move really quickly. So there's a balance between quantifying the upside and then also quantifying the risk. 15 seconds. So my ask of you tonight is you need to get a brief. If you don't have one in your pockets already about what's currently on the table and we are currently operating at the Margarita Inn and we may not have a legal basis for operating a transitional shelter at the Margarita Inn right now. And so we're incurring risk. If you're not aware of it, I would encourage you to get a brief and then determine what your next steps are. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Betty Bogg. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Ms. City Clerk, Ms. Interim City Manager and members of the City Council. I'm Betty Bogg. I'm the Executive Director of Connections for the Homeless. 
Our mission is simple and clear. We serve and catalyze our community to end homelessness one person at a time. In the last two years, Connections has housed more than 300 people experiencing homelessness at local hotels, including the Margarita Inn. You may be aware that we're in conversations to purchase the Margarita Inn from its current owner. Due to the sensitive nature of these discussions, I can't comment further on that process. I do, however, want you and the community to be aware that Connections provides rich wraparound services through professionally licensed staff, trained residential workers, and partnerships with community providers. In addition to intensive case management, our services include on-site physical and mental health care via licensed nursing staff and a mental health professional who provides individual and group therapy. Our top priority is the safety and well-being of our entire community, including our participants and staff. Staff at the Margarita Inn are skilled in de-escalation and crisis intervention training. We are in direct and regular communication with the mayor, police, and other city staff, city council members, and many members of the public. Surveillance cameras are in place inside and outside the Margarita Inn. We have also built and utilized a comprehensive system to track and manage reports of incidents in all of our sites. Our systems records and publicly available police data do not easily reconcile. We are doing a thorough analysis of both sets of data and we'll be meeting with City of Evanston staff and police on May 17th to discuss our findings. We will certainly update council once we've agreed on a common set of facts. As always, I'm available to answer questions or concerns. We look forward to deeper engagement with the community as we continue through the zoning process. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to those who signed up uh, online. Uh, I believe all of them will be speaking online. Uh, and so we begin with Annie Coakley, who will be followed by Mike Vasilko and then Mary Rosinski. Good evening, Mayor Viss, City Clerk Mendoza, and members of the City Council. I'm Annie Coakley, the Director of Downtown Evanston. This afternoon, I sent a letter of support co-signed by myself and Laura Brown of Downtown Evanston, Catherine Gatsik of the Main Dumpster Mile, Angela Schaefer of Central Street Evanston, Wendy Weaver of Central Evanston Business Association, Gina Speckman of Chicago's North Shore Convention and Visitor Bureau, and Gary Karp of the Evanston Chamber of Commerce. We fully support the staff's recommendation to hire Interface Studio and their partners to create a business district strategy, strategy and implementation plan. As business district management directors, we strongly feel that Evanston needs to take major steps to stay competitive with the surrounding communities and continue to provide exciting experiences for our residents. As you may know, several nearby communities have recently invested in streetscape and public space improvements. And hearing about these investments in other communities and seeing the benefits for those businesses further demonstrates the need for a strategic change in our community. Not only do we need to fill vacant storefronts, but we need to create a dynamic spaces and experiences in our commercial districts that make people want to visit, shop, dine, and stay on a regular basis. We need return customers. We cannot rely solely on Evanston residents. Now is the time to invest in our commercial districts that are essential, essential to the Evanston community. We look forward to working with Interface and their team on this opportunity to explore strategies through community engagement with many of our partners and stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mike Vasilko, who will be followed by Mary Rosinski and then Leslie Williams. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so item F1, uh, which is the adjusting of last year's budget uh, by $11 million. Uh, last time the council met, this was tabled or held till tonight. But I don't see any response to Council Member Kelly's request for staff to provide a roadmap for how they're gonna change and reform the practice of uninformed consent by way of the 
bills list and the um, credit card list. So there's nothing in the packet about that. So I'm not quite sure how that's, I mean, I guess it'll have to be held again until more information comes forward. Um, so staff hasn't been highlighting what's going to come back the next year for approved overspending, like this $11 million from last year. So I mentioned during the um, APW, as an example, there are $200,000 a month, roughly, of credit card bills, which for 12 months averages about $2.4 million each year in spending that wasn't necessarily budgeted for or approved. That's one example of probably where this 10 or $11 million comes from. So I guess I'd like to understand why there was no response yet from Council Member Kelly, from her uh, request of staff, I should say. Also, uh, I, I think a number of items should be held until the new city manager is um, brought on board. I get the feeling you're very close to making a selection uh, if you haven't already done so. Additional staffing is one item. Uh, item A4, item A3. Uh, I, may, I know some of these things some people feel are urgent, but you got a new city manager coming in, he should have the opportunity to be part of the process. There's item A7, consultants for street lighting and sidewalk improvements. Uh, I believe that's a couple hundred thousand dollars. Item E1 is a contract to spend $245,000 of ARPA funds. Uh, but I heard in the interviews, the both candidates were very interested in how ARPA funds are spent. So I would just suggest items E1, A3, A4, A7, and anything else that relates to spending, big spending seconds. That, the city, that the city manager should be involved in. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker will be Mary Rosinski, who is then followed by Leslie Williams and Sue Lolbach. Hi, uh, my name is Mary Rosinski, and I'm speaking to agree with Michael Vesicle and what he just said. The budget going over $11 million without each member being well aware that when they voted yes on bills, it did put that department over budget is not an acceptable way to do business and with our tax dollars. So I would love to see us reform that and have, you know, and a budget that shows, you know, as, as close as you can get to year to date expenses, meaning if you're budgeted, you know, $10 million for something and it's October, did you spend 10 million at that point? Are you at 8 million? Or are you going over 12 million before you go and spend the money? I think that's really important. Emergencies can happen. We all understand that. But this a budget is something to be followed and taken very seriously. Because if we spend that money inappropriately on things that we didn't need, then we don't have it for the other things that we do need. The second thing is um, with the city manager, I really wish we had more time to hear again now answers to that those video discussions that we saw on Friday night. I don't think there was enough time and the survey was so vague. Um, but there was, you know, I really am in support from what I could tell researching in the internet and whatnot with Mr. Poche. I think he brings a clear vision, a clean slate, and I hope you will seriously look at it. Ann Arbor unfortunately seems to be having so many of the same challenges that Evanston has had and is continuing to have and i just don't feel we need to be bringing more we need to move forward and be better so that's all i have to say i hope you have a good day and i would like to know when you're actually going to make the decision on the city manager thank you very much thank you the next speaker is leslie williams who will be followed by sue lolbach and then dorian price uh good evening council and mayor Biss. i am leslie williams from the seventh ward but I'm speaking on behalf of the Community Alliance for Better Government. Evanston's been through a long and painful few years, racial discrimination lawsuits, the revolutions of sexual abuse among beach staff, 
and the rapid departure of a city manager, police chief, parks chief, and head of human resources. We're sharply divided over many issues, and many of them have racial overtones. So in choosing a city manager, we don't need someone telling us what they think we should do. We need an empathetic leader with vision, compassion, humility, and the ability to build consensus and trust in city government. We need Snapper Poche. Both our finalists are highly intelligent civic leaders with strong track records. But while the other candidate gave specific and detailed answers to a myriad of questions, what impresses us about Mr. Poche is his willingness to listen, to acknowledge a mistake and rectify it. When he was discussing a plan he had devised to improve code violation inspections, he acknowledged that it was a flop because he had not involved the community. So he went back to the drawing board and hired inspectors who lived in the communities, realizing that it required a profound understanding of the people and the population you're serving. This is leadership, trying something new, admitting failure rather than blaming other people, learning from it, and then doing better. When discussing budgets and programs, Mr. Poche speaks of values and even morals. Budgets are not just numbers. He talks about shifting the discussion from dollars to values and investment in those values. He sees funding social services as part of the city's moral grounding. Empathy, humility, values, morals. This is the type of language we need from city officials, and this is the language that inspires trust. Evansonians have a strong interest in climate change, but few of us have been as directly harmed by it as Mr. Poche. The child of a Louisiana fisherman, his family lost their commercial fishing livelihood because of the decline of the area's natural resources. Climate change and climate justice are not just abstractions for him. When he discusses our climate action and resiliency plan, he wants to see accountability and results, stating that a goal without a plan is meaningless. Finally, we're impressed with Mr. Poche's honesty about the challenges of implementing racial equity. He speaks eloquently of the importance of individual learning around race, freely admitting that this has been a major part of his own journey. He stresses that all stakeholders and departments need to acknowledge that racism is an issue and that it requires empathy. True racial equity is more than simply having staff who speak different languages or implicit bias training. It will also involve shifting resources to those who have been marginalized. Both candidates have impressive resumes and years of public service, but we feel Mr. Poche's values and live commitment to climate resilience, increasing transparency, community engagement, and racial equity in municipal, municipal services make him the best fit for Evanston. The Community Alliance for Better Government proudly endorses Snapper Poche for city manager. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Sue Lobach, who will be followed by Dorian Price. Hi, Mayor. I believe Sue is going to pass. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. In that case, the next speaker is Dorian Price. Hello? Uh, yes, we can hear you, Ms. Price. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm echoing uh, what Leslie and Mary and Mike uh, said about the importance of the city manager um, and moving forward. And uh, also with regard to the importance of engaging people um, in the way that um, Snapper Poche, who I also support, uh, and the organizations I work, I work with um, uh, in terms of his candidacy as being the city manager. So given that context, I can read what I wrote. And um, uh, the full resident input is needed to select adjudication officers who include com community values and challenges for real justice in the absence of attorneys, because we know people can't afford them and are not um, given to people the way we do city uh, adjudication right now. The city manager candidate, Snapper uh, Pouche, gave examples in learning, uh, learning the importance of taking time to include those most affected having the best outcomes and buy-in waiting for the next city manager with such options to unify Evans's divided community is too important to rush. So I, I really think that we should wait for these really important decisions, including the adjudication officers, considering what others have gone through, including myself, that could use a little improvement. So thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Uh, that includes, that's not a word. That concludes this evening's public comment. Um, the, this brings us to the uh, consent agenda. Before we begin the consent agenda, I wanted to um, 
just give the council and also anyone who might be watching kind of a, a, a guide for the rest of the evening. As everyone knows, we have a, an important discussion to hold in executive session. Uh, and there was a variety of opinions about the right time in the evening to do it. Uh, ultimately, a uh, majority of council uh, believe that in the interest of both uh, the ability of the public to see the whole um, substantive agenda in a timely fashion, as well as out of respect for our staff who may be involved in the discussions, we'll hold the executive session at the end of the um, at the end of the agenda as per usual. Um, the only thing I would say in light of that uh, decision is that because of the importance of the discussion we'll be having uh, in our executive session, I would urge people to, to um, move through the agenda with as much efficiency as possible so that people's minds are, are as fresh as can be when we enter that discussion as well. Um, with that, uh, does anyone have items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Yes, uh, I just want to announce uh, from APW that item uh, A15 was held in committee, or was tabled, until, so it's still in committee. Uh, I'd like to pull item A16 and item A18. F1. Oh, and uh, I guess I'll also pull the Amazon credit card activity. Which is A1? A2. A2. <clears throat> Councilmember Sufferden, did you have uh, something? Yeah, could you please pull item A14, A17, and um, I just want to announce that item P2 was uh, also uh, tabled in uh, committee. So far I have A2, A14, 15, 16, 17, 18, P2, and F1. Is there anything else? Yep, so A2, and then a whole bunch in a row, A14, A15, A16, A17, and A18, then P2 and F1. Any additions to that list? <clears throat> Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. I move the consent agenda minus the items that have been removed, which is item A2, my apologies, A14, A15, 16, 17, uh, A18, and then item F1. And P2. And P2. Is there a second? Second. second. Council Member Reed moves the consent agenda except for A2, A14, A15, A16, A17, A18, P2, and F1. Council Member Wynn seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Wynn? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Sufferden? Aye. Councilmember Bravell? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hedda Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. With nine voting in favor and none voting against, the consent agenda, uh, with the exception of the items previously named, uh, is adopted. Um, Councilmember Reed, do you want to make a motion on item A2? Yes, Chair, I move item A2. Uh, approval of BMO Harris uh, Amazon credit card activity in the amount of $4,527.66. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Councilmember Reed moves item A2. Councilmember Braithwaite seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Wynn? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Sarfordin? I abstain. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hedakaris? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. With eight members voting in favor, none voting against, and one abstention, item A2 passes. Councilmember Reed, would you like to make a motion on item A14? Yes. Uh, I move resolution 35R22, authorizing funding for, for lead service line replacement work Forest Development Program for A, I think is the, something should be there. I move that. Second. Council Member Reed moves item A14. Council Member Braithwaite seconds. Is there any discussion? We begin with Council Member Sufferden. Thanks. Um, and uh, 
Director Stoneback, sorry, I, I just want to um, reiterate the question that I asked in email. Uh, is there any w the path to there being some accommodation for people who paid for the replacement of their previous lead service lines to get some sort of credit or, or discount on the on the proposed rate increase? Good evening, Dave Stoneback, and from uh, Deputy City Manager. At this point in time, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to demote you. You're right, Deputy City Manager, not Director. That's your old life. I prefer oh. Public Works Director. Uh, <laughs> at, at this point in time, staff does not have a proposal to uh, make uh, any kind of break for people that have already placed their lead service line with a copper line. Uh, it'd be challenging for us to de determine that if and when they actually did it, because some homes were built with a copper line, so it was just part of the, uh, of the construction of homes. Other places uh, went from a one-inch service to a one-and-a-half-inch service, and doing that, they put copper in instead of lead. So it's really hard to discern whether they did it to increase their size or to replace a lead service line. And if it was an increase in size, I don't think that that would be something that the city would want to uh, then give them a break on. So I don't have if, – if council has a way of, of – I mean, is there a way to do it? We, we know – what by permits that were pulled like who's done the work it, i'm not sure that i can't speak for how accurate the permits would be we're finding that uh our lead service line inventory is somewhat inaccurate because we have less lead lines than what we thought i mean not oh. great numbers but we're finding maybe a hundred or so that are actually copper already that we previously had thought were lead so we we did try to track the the permits, but because some of the permit application is online, you're not sure okay. where they put in on it, and it would just be very challenging to make sure we got everybody accurate and and fair. So. Gotcha. I, yeah, my concern is that there are people who pro you know paid for this in one go, and they'll also be affected by the rate increase. Yes, as well. and, and then so the people that we had loaned money to as part of the water main projects. We did forgive all their uh, debt or, you know, to re continue repaying it once the city passed the bill. So we kind of or passed the policy that replacing lead service line is a public health benefit. That's when we stopped charging anybody in the future because we could go way back and have a, an unknown burden to try to pay people back or, or give them a reduced rate. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Councilmember Reed. Yeah, I don't want to belabor this, uh, but I, I just uh, I'm supportive of this. Uh, I think to uh, just just you know it, it, we we I think that one of the answers that I don't think I heard from directors from interim manager Stoneback <laughs> is that uh, he mentioned it, but that we just designated this a public good and thereby we're all on the hook for it. I've residents, I'm sure who've replaced their water lines and would. I understand where you're going with the uh, questioning and the uh, policy question, uh, but just like folks who don't have kids or have had kids go through the school system, we're all on the hook here. That's it. Thank you. Seeing no one else seeking to speak, uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Wynn? Aye. Councilmember Nilsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Sufferton? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Heracadis? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Councilmember Braithwaite? Aye. With nine voting in favor and none voting against, item A14 passes. Uh, Councilmember Reed, did you want to make a motion on item A16? Yes, I move item A16, ordinance 32 22 uh, amending title 2 chapter 2 of the city code to reflect changes in the oh, I'm sorry I actually don't want to move this if someone else wants to uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor I will move item a 16 ordinance 32-0-22 amending title 2 chapter 2 of the city code to reflect changes in the public safety commission rules second councilmember Newsman moves item a 16 councilmember Braithwaite seconds is there any discussion Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Wynn? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? I mean, Aye. Councilmember Newsma. I apologize. Councilmember Burns? 
Aye. Council Member Sufferton? Aye. Council Member Ravel? Aye. Council Member Reed? No. Council Member Hedakaris? Aye. Council Member Kelly? Aye. And then Council Member Brithwood said aye. Aye. With eight voting in favor and one voting against, item A16 passes. Uh, this brings us to item A17. Council Member Reed, would you like to make a motion on this one? Yes. Uh, ordinance four, I, I move Ordinance 42022, amending portions of Title Seven, Chapter 8, Wheel Tax uh, of the City Code. Is there? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Was that? Okay. Council Member Reed moves item A17. Council Member Braithwaite seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Wynn? Aye. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Sufferton? No. Council Member Ravel? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Hedakaris? Aye. Council Member Kelly? No. Council Member Braithwaite? With seven voting in favor and two voting against, item A17 passes. Uh, Council Member Reed, would you like to make a motion on item A18? Yes. Uh, I move that we refer item A18 back to, uh, I'm sorry, what committee did this come from? APW. Oh, okay. <laughs> I move that we refer this back to APW. I will second that. So Council Member Reed moves to uh, refer item A18 back to ANPW. Council Member Newsom seconds. Is there any discussion? Council Member Reed. Yeah, I, I just want to raise why. There may be other reasons, but I, I had I brought this to a ward meeting. Uh, res, residents of the 8th Ward are starkly opposed, uh, particularly to uh, Custer being named a, a truck route. I think folks are fine with Howard uh, from our discussions. Although I also question, you know, Howard being deemed a, a truck route, we only own and control half of Howard. Uh, so I'm curious about the impacts on the other half and what that means for a truck that's, you know, it can only travel in one direction on Howard, I guess. Uh, particularly, I, I just like more opportunity to have uh, our traffic engineering staff come to the ward uh, and, and look at alternative solutions and how we might be able, it seems like the problem particularly impacts one business in the fourth ward. Certainly want to support that uh, fourth ward business, but I, I think we can figure out how to do this in a way that both helps the business and respects the desires of uh, particularly eighth warders along Custer and throughout the, throughout the ward. Thank you. Council Member Newsom. Uh, it's certainly related to one uh, business in particular in the fourth ward, but uh, the issue is more of a, a, a public safety, uh, life safety issue. So. Uh, we'll take this one back. We'll talk with uh, Rajiv, who was out of the office the last two weeks, which is why we couldn't get it done for tonight. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll on the motion to refer this item back to ANPW? Council Member Wynn? Aye. Council Member Newsma? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Sufferton? Aye. Council Member Ravel? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Aye. Council Member Kelly? Council Member Braithwaite? Aye. With nine voting in favor and none voting against, item A18 is referred back to the Administration and Public Works Committee. Council Member Wynn, would you like to make a motion on item F1? Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, I move Ordinance 26022, authorizing the interim city manager to increase the total fiscal year 2021 budget. Staff recommends approval of Ordinance 26022, authorizing the interim city manager to increase the total fiscal year 2021 budget by 11 million five hundred fifty four thousand four hundred seventy three from $296,146,105 to a new total of $307,700,578. The Finance and Budget Committee recommended a budget amendment in the amount of $11,554,473. million five five four four seven three. Second. for introduction. Oh, sorry. Second. Uh, so Council Member Wynn moves item F1. Was that you, Council Member Reed? Uh, yes. Council Member Reed seconds. 
Is there any discussion? Uh, Council Member Reed. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Hatesh. Hi, Mr. Desai, how are you, sir? Hi, good evening, Mayor, members, City Council. Go ahead, Council Member. Yes. Um, can you answer, uh, what, is our, uh, what is our general fund balance right now? General fund balance as of the audited year last year, which is December 31st, 2020, is $17 oh, I'm sorry, did you say $17 million? Yes. Okay. What is, as of December 31st, 2020. Uh, what, what about based on our, for example, our last quarterly report? We will have to see the numbers because some of those, what we call a balance sheet items, are not included in our monthly report. But if, if you look at the for 2021, example. which I think I read the presentation. Uh, for, for example, uh, in, the, in the quarterly report, uh, the most recent quarterly report, can you, right. answer, can you so answer what, what the general fund balance is there? Uh, it's around 30 that million. Ended March 31st, see. correct? Uh, Okay, so the monthly report, um, the cash balance is around $37 million, but again, um, and the fund balance is 41, but the things which don't include here is are uh, like the sub payables, the bills which haven't paid. Uh, so some of those things are not. So that's why I like to go by the audited report. Uh, and that's why I said 31st December 2020 is 17. Uh, 2021, we expect to close with another 12 to 13 million. So I expect the December 31st, 2021 balance, a fund balance to be around $30 million. So are you saying when, when everything is settled, once the budget is completely audited, as of December 31st, 2021, or are you saying 2022, 2021? 21. Okay, 2021. We, at that date, we would have had 30. 30 to 31 million in fund balance. Uh, 30 million and, in the fund, okay. And and what uh, and how much of that thirty million, right? We want our general fund balance to sit at seventeen million, correct? Well, I mean, we the city council has adopted the policy of sixteen point six six percent, which equates to um, around nineteen point six million dollars. Okay, so we want nineteen million dollars sitting in our, our general fund, roughly. Uh, based, Little over that. Based on our finances from this year, our general fund expenditures from this year, great. And uh, of that 30 million that you say that as of December 31st, uh, 2021, we had in the bank, where do you expect at the end of this year? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't expect you to be the Oracle of Evanston, but at the end of the year, where would you expect that we may be? Uh, um, I mean, I would expect at least to kind of stay at budget or a little above the budget. I mean, we have this conversation in our what do you call our finance officials peer group that some of those revenues like which have shown great progress the steep increase in 2021 one of the reasons uh, both on sales tax and inflation the inflation is the thing you know now once it settles down uh, the feds is raising the rates uh, we might have a reduced rate of sales tax revenue as well as some of those home rule taxes which are based on the gross revenue so we'll keep an eye but at least yes i think um we could yeah you know, you we could meet our budget or maybe even do a little better than what our budget so, so you expect that, that by the end of 2022 when we when everything's said and done you expect that the balance will be still roughly 30 million dollars 30 32 million correct unless well, we don't i mean i think i had a presentation in one of the slides uh, which talks about because we need the money uh, for some of the places uh, so if you want to go into that detail, yes, I have a, one of those uh, slide on my presentation talks about that. that. No, no, that, that's helpful. Thank, thank you for the answers there. But I, I just wanted to be clear that it seems like we're in pretty healthy financial shape. We're about 10 to $12 million over, or really closer to $13, $14 million over what we need for, uh, according to our own goals, you know, 16.66 percent. We're about 10 to $12 million over that, which is a very good place to be. I have one last question because I feel as though my time is ending. Oh, well, even still, I have one more question. Uh, and uh, that is, so we've, we've gone through this. I, I still am curious about um, there's, 
a, a few million dollars. Most of the money was approved by council at some point, but there are some funds still that remain that, for example, overtime for, for certain departments where the city staff did not come and seek authorization to expend hundreds of thousands of dollars in funds prior to those funds being expended. First, is my is that correct? Is my generalization there correct? That for, uh, exa for example, the fire department, the $400,000 that they went over, that they did not seek authorization prior to going over? I mean, I don't know, this is the part of the payroll, so city uh, staff has never come into that. And generally, we, every month when I put the budget report out, the monthly financials out, we talk about the police and fire over time. And one of the reasons fire was over time because they had so many vacancies. So they had a savings in the salary line item, which is a regular line item, but they went over in the overtime line item. Yeah, and, and, and again, I want to be clear, in no way am I uh, assuming that that service is necessary and that this body wouldn't have approved it, but we have a legal authority, we have the legal duty to approve it, and it should have been approved. And again, I don't want, I'm just using the fire department because that slips to the top of my mind. There are a few other departments um, that, that, that had a similar pattern. And so just to be clear, what you're saying is that no, those overages were not approved by the council. I mean, it's never come to the city council for approval because the council adopts the budget at the fund level. So we come to you as a, uh, when the fund goes over, not particular line item or particular business. Unit. So that's why I'm there and talking about at the fund level because city council adopts the budget at the fund level. Okay, and the fire department's in a general fund. Right. And you're saying that because we adopted the budget, we didn't go over the fire department was fine to spend those funds without further authorization. I just highlighted, yes, a few items, but I can see that fire department has savings in so many other places because they were short of staff. But okay, so the council may the not have to approve it, but it, but the city manager retains the ability to transfer money between funds, correct? Or, or let me, is that correct? The city manager can transfer between funds or only between within uh, funds. account fund or line items within the funds within within the fund itself some of the line so items. you couldn't transfer from general fund to, to water fund or, or no. without council authorization correct great and i will say to you with regard to the fire department just for example we i don't know if you recall we renegotiated during 2020 the minimum manning um so that number of re required staffing per day increased and we were down firefighters so now that they're more fully staffed you shouldn't see those numbers okay. well thank you i just wanted to get further understanding uh and make sure that we're all or at least i'm on the same page with staff on what is required to come to council and what isn't i i, I do wonder one last question uh, uh to manager Ganderski. this is kind of separate but related in that later on, on or we approved uh a new position or we are going to approve a new position uh, which, uh, which is funded through the general fund. Um, is there currently, and do we have a, any kind of headcount restrictions built into our budgeting? No. So we have, um, within the general fund, there's business uh, units. So what Hitesh does every year, what we tend to do in the city manager's office is our best to estimate what we're going to need for each business unit based on the number of full-time positions. Um, and then try to you try to estimate the best you can any contingencies. So you know for contractual issues or something like that, um, it's not it's not a perfect system. So some items you go over, and some items you spend under. Um, luckily, I think the good news that Hitesh is giving us is that overall we went under, but we went over on some items. So the old phrase "Rob Peter to pay Paul" is kind of kind of the the system when you have line items that are over and line items that are under the general fund itself, you wouldn't want to go over um, without talking, you know, coming to council, you wouldn't want to overspend all your line items or spend an expenditure um, that far exceeds what you budgeted. But line, uh, the business units themselves can go over by nature of staff leaving. We have to pay out their vacation. We have to make pension payments um, to staff that retire. So those are things that we can't always predict for each business unit. And, and then, may I ask, this, this is last question or, or so. Uh, then why in that instance are you coming to council for authorization for this position if it's within budget? Well, given the 
possibility that that business unit could now go over based on that position. It's an adding on a full-time position. I brought it to council. But that because in the future, it wouldn't be budgeted for. So if we, if we added that position right now, come looking at the 2023 budget, I don't have a full-time position that would have to be added back in. So now it's in. And we'll just settle up next year with the 2023 budget amendment if we go over that business unit. But right now we're not looking like we're going to go over that business unit line item. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Kelly. Thank you. So, um, you know, I think as everyone knows, I held it. Really, it's about the process, not so, not that much about overspending per se. And I, I just want to say I am happy that I, you know, feel I've had productive and beneficial conversations with city manager Gandersky. And though it's not in the packet, I, I believe there is a commitment to improve the process going forward. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that so that we're, we're it's actually in the memo we did outline. Okay. Um, yes. Um, Councilmember Kelly asked, and I said this would be reasonable for um, CFO decides to report quarterly um, to the budget and finance committee, any um, overages of business units um, in particular. So he can print a report and discuss that at the budget and finance committee each quarter. And projected, right? Projected overages and pro projected surpluses. Yes, also. We, absolutely. Both projected surpluses. So this is great. I think this is progress. So um, thank you. Seeing no further discussion, uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Wynn? Yeah, aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Sefferton? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hedakadis? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? Uh, with nine voting in favor and none voting against, item F1 passes. This brings us to call of the wards, beginning with Council Member Wynn. No report, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Newsma. Uh, fourth Ward office hours, Saturday, May 14th, 10 to noon at Reprise Roasters. And thank you to all of the Fourth Ward residents who have weighed in on any number of issues, uh, not the least of which was the city manager selection. Thank you. Council Member Burns. Um, just wanted to say thank you to my colleagues up here and also to, to city staff. Um, the, the lead pipe replacement workforce development program is, uh, is based on a referral that I made back in August. Uh, it, it's also just to show community members we are putting in some work up here, but, but things uh, occasionally take some time to go through the process. Again, this is something that um, was nine months in the making. And uh, we are mandated by the state of Illinois, for those who don't know, and it's not just Illinois, it's other cities, uh, that we need to replace our, our lead pipes in roughly 30 years, I believe. And my question when I first heard this is, um, how can we prioritize Evanston residents? How can we ensure uh, that Evanston residents are, are taking on that work, which I calculated if you multiply the average cost uh, to replace a lead line um, um, with how many the city can do, which is the portion uh, between the um, the service valve and the in the in the water main uh, is about eighty million dollars. And so, uh, typically, what we've done in the past, we had a, a deep water tunnel project way before my time, but we would contract out for for this work, and we'll still need to do that. Uh, but what we've done this time is a shift that we've actually set aside a portion of the work that uh, city staff is capable of training other community members to do. Uh, and that's roughly, I think, to the tune, if I did my math right, about $700,000 we'll be putting uh, back into the community through employing people. We still have some work to do. It's going to start off as an apprenticeship program, and then hopefully we can keep all, if not most, um, with the city for the full-time permanent work. Um, but this is a, a really exciting opportunity, so thank you for the support on this. Thank you to, uh, to Dave, who's been putting together all the numbers and making this possible. Thank you. Councilmember Sufferton. No report. Councilmember Ravel. Uh, no report. Councilmember Reed. I uh, just want to uh, note the uh, eighth ward ward meeting is the last Thursday of this month at 6 p.m. as it always uh, is, and so uh, for folks uh, to be aware of that. Um, 
That's it. Thank you. Councilmember Hedekaris. Nothing to report. Councilmember Kelly. Nothing to report. Councilmember Braithwaite. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This Thursday, 7 p.m., uh, virtual second ward meeting. Thank you. Councilmember Newsom has recognized for a motion. Pursuant to 5 Illinois Compiled Statutes 120-2A, I move that the City Council convene into executive session to discuss agenda items regarding personnel and litigation. Uh, these agenda items are permitted subjects to be considered in executive session and are enumerated exceptions under the Open Meetings Act as set forth in 5 ILCS 120-2A, sections C1 and C11. Councilmember Newsman moves that the council uh, resolve itself into an executive session. Councilmember Wynn seconds. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Wynn? Aye. Councilmember Newsman? Aye. Councilmember Burns? Aye. Councilmember Sufferton? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hedakaris? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Braithwaite? With nine voting in favor and none voting against, the motion passes. And at 8.11 p.m., the council resolves into an executive session to begin immediately in the council member library. At 11.35 p.m., the uh, open session of the city council uh, continues. The council member Zuffman is recognized for a motion. Yeah, I move that uh, we recess to the call of the chair. Second. Council member Zuffman moves that we recess to the call of the chair. Council member Wynn seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, Council Member Wynn? Aye. Council Member Newsman? Aye. Council Member Burns? Aye. Council Member Sutton? Aye. Council Member Riddell? Aye. Council Member Reed? No. Council Member Kelly? Aye. Uh, with six voting in favor and one voting against, if I kind of right, um, yes, I think I did. With six voting in favor and one voting against, the motion uh, carries. And this meeting uh, is recessed to the call of the chair.